I love Bleach. Shocker, I know. But the more I reread content, the more I think over Taita Kubo's magnum opus, the more I look into it, my understanding of the world and the possibilities we have at our disposal grows even stronger. A lot of people, not counting you who's watching right now, you're okay, but a lot of other people constantly make the mistake of taking Bleach at face value and not looking underneath the surface to the deeper messages that Kubo is trying to convey. When you peer through the annals of Bleach history, witnessing the betrayals, the wars, the sacrifices, and the joy that follows, it reads like a pretty straightforward narrative of events that detail what happened and nothing more. But the story within the story, and at the same time, the story outside the story, tells an epic tale that captures the essence of Bleach in a humongous way. And so let's not waste any more time. Let me show you what I mean when I talk about Bleach's end game. The story of Bleach revolves around the young Ichigo Kurosaki who's trying to find balance and synergy within himself and within the world around him. His journey is filled with emotional moments where he meets new people, he forges bonds, he protects and defends said bonds, and stands in opposition to those who wish to destroy all life as he knows it. That all seems well and good, but what I'm going to do here is inject one concept into the mix. I'm going to inject the very well-known concept of fate. Yes, that's right, fate. But please don't worry, this is not an Ichigo Bankai theory video. I know you've heard those to death already. This, in my opinion, is something far greater. So, let's define fate so we're all on the same page on how we're going to use it for this video and for videos into the future. Fate refers to the supernatural power beyond the individual that tries to bring a specific end result into reality. A different way of defining it is that it refers to the existent power beyond individual control that tries to affect real life events because it wants to bring about a particular end result. For example, and this isn't actually true, it's just an example, fate may want an end result where Ichigo becomes a Soyeper. And so, it alters natural events so that Rukia appears in Katakura Town. It causes a hollow to appear in Ichigo's house and pushes Rukia to give her powers to Ichigo. Also, it can end up at the specific endpoint of Ichigo becoming a Soul Reaper. Readers and consumers of numerous literary works have different opinions on the use of fate in stories. Some feel like if a character is ordained by fate to accomplish this feat, it diminishes the value of their struggle. Others might feel like a character chosen by fate still tells an equally thrilling story, just in its own unique way, separate from other styles of storytelling. You see this discourse a lot with Naruto being the child of prophecy or Luffy bearing the burden of being sun god Nika, heralded to bring in the destruction of the known world and ushering in a new age of peace. It's up to you to decide how you feel about fate in those stories. But in the story of Bleach, while everyone is zigging, Kubo decides to zag. In the world of Bleach, fate isn't working in favor of our heroes. No. In Bleach, fate is not your friend. Fate is your enemy. And this is key to understanding this theory of mine. So stick with me. I know these points may seem unconnected, but there's a method to this madness. Let's talk about fate in Bleach. First off, is Ichigo a beneficiary of fate? Let's start there. Ichigo is a character often viewed through the lens of, um, how can I call this, convenience? Like, they see that he's a hybrid of all the races in Bleach and characterize that as Ichigo being set up to have everything handed to him and to be this overly perfect being with all these abilities and so on. And you know what? I get why they might think that, but that's not the case with Ichigo. You see, typically, when people speak of these set in stone results and outcomes, the thing that gives it away is its frequency. If it happens once or twice, it's not really that big of a deal. The problem arises if it's rampant and happens often. For example, and I really hope my One Piece brothers and sisters watching this aren't going to be too mad at me for doing this, but I'm arguing from a point of good faith, please believe me. Luffy has a similar setup to Ichigo insofar as his dad is a revolutionary who's very powerful, his grandfather is a marine legend who is extremely strong. One brother is the son of Goldie Roger, the Pirate King, and the other is a noble's son who becomes the number two revolutionary in the world. He's from a legendary clan of D and has one of the most influential devil fruit abilities in the known world. That right there is a lot, but even then, 
I bet a lot of people would still be willing to overlook it. But all of a sudden, these unique, impossible, odd coincidences start to show up. For example, it's floating in a barrel in the open sea where if he makes contact with the water even once, he's dead. It's Luffy being saved by a bolt of lightning at Locktown when he was dead to right. It's Luffy being saved from Crocodile by Robin, or being saved by Ivankov after Magellan uses his toxic powers, or just happening to meet the one person in the entire world who could save him after eating poisonous fish, just by chance, in Sanji's older sister. In situations like that, it's very clear that fate is on his side. And while I don't even have a problem with that in One Piece, that's definitely not the case in Bleach. The uniqueness of Ichigo's birth is 100% a rarity that does not usually happen. Yes, absolutely, but that's all it is. The circumstances around Ichigo's uniqueness has more to do with people's wills than it has to do with supernatural fate. Aizen Sosuke of his own free will was conducting hollow experiments in Karakuta Town, a town that is rich in spiritual pressure and a place where multiple spiritually awakened beings usually propagate in. His hollow killed a number of soul weepers and began to draw attention. Ishin Shiba, captain of Squad 10, learned of these veiled deaths and personally went in to investigate. When he gets there, he encounters Aizen's hollow known as White, and they engage in battle. Now, as he established before, Karakura is a spot with a high concentration of Ryatsu, so many spiritually aware beings live here. Also living in Karakura Town are the remnants of the Quincy. Typically, the Quincy do not interfere in Soul Reaper battles. They only go out after the battle is over. But in this case, Masaki Kurosaki, acting on her own will and desires, goes out and helps Ishin defeat White. But unfortunately, she gets bitten by White in the process. This meeting was pure coincidence. Aizen Sosuke and Kaname Tosin see Masaki enter the fight, and Kaname wants to exterminate her at once because she's interfering when he's stopped by Aizen because Aizen is enjoying the spontaneity of the entire situation. Aizen expects Masaki to die from soul suicide, but she survives thanks to Kisuke, who binds her and Ishin's soul together. This union ultimately becomes Ichigo, who possesses the power of a hollow, soul Yeeper, Quincy, and Fullbring. I fully understand how broken that is, but Ichigo is a being born from the decisions that were opposing the natural law. Masaki should have died, the Quincy and Shinigami should not have married, and a being like Ichigo should not have been born. But he was. Keep this act of defiance of the natural law in mind. It'll become a trend. You'll see. The other point I want to establish before we continue is Aizen's role in all of this, because the closest you'll get to a fate figure in Ichigo's life is Aizen. Aizen knew about Masaki and Ishin's connection, and when she didn't die, Aizen knew that Kisuke must have been the one to save her, and he knew that a being formed by the combination of Sweeper and a defiled Quincy would be one to keep an eye on. And so, Aizen himself impacted the events of Ichigo's life. Aizen had Fishbone D attack Ichigo. Aizen drew more hollows to Uryu's bait than naturally possible. Aizen revealed Ruki's location to the Soul Society higher-ups and made sure that Renji and Byakuya were the ones to apprehend her. Aizen sent Ukiora into the world of the living to appraise Ichigo's abilities. He then captures Orihime and brings her to Wakamundo, knowing that Ichigo will come to Wakamundo to save her, causing Soul Society to act in order to retrieve their most important asset. Kubo actually makes a mockery of the argument of fate by Aizen himself stating that, did you think it was fate? And so, fate exists in Bleach, but this isn't it. This is merely Aizen's scheme in his way into creating the perfect research subject. Aizen is not forcing outcomes out of Ichigo. Ichigo is having to push himself through these battles and he almost dies countless times. It's either Yoruichi who is monitoring his spiritual pressure in his battle against Kenpachi, or it's Grim Jiao saving Orihime so she can heal Ichigo for their one-on-one -on -one battle, or it's White taking over Ichigo to preserve his life. These aren't unnatural coincidences. These aren't coming out of nowhere. Yoruichi in Soul Society was monitoring everyone's spiritual pressure and paying close attention to Ichigo from a distance, springing in to save his life once the battle was over. Grimja was hellbent on a rematch with Ichigo and owed Orihime after she healed his arm, and White had been saving Ichigo's life for many key moments in Soul Society leading up to his resurrection against Okiora. But once we come into the Thousand Year Blood War, fate takes on a new meaning. Because in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, we meet Yuha Baha, the king of all the Quincy 
and the wielder of the greatest power in the Bleach series so far, the Almighty. Yuha, more than anyone, brings the concept of fate closer than ever before. Yuha's almighty eyes give him the power to see the future, to see fate, if you will, and it also gives him the power to change it. The overarching idea of fate still exists in the world of Bleach, but the closest any individual character comes to the idea of fate or destiny is if they're wielding the Almighty, and that would be Yuha Baha in this case. That's the closest any individual person will get to the divine fate. And so, what Kubo does here is that he crafts a war arc between the Shinigami and the Quincy, and he places the concept of the Almighty at the center of it all. The arc begins with a prophecy of a slain Quincy king, and this prophecy details future events. It details fate. The outcome is already decided. The confined Quincy king regains his pulse after 900 years, regains his mind after 90 years, regains his strength after 90 years, and regains the world in nine days. That is a fateful prophecy of things to come, with the last nine days being the final stepping point. Kubo hides the secret of the entire Bleach narrative within this arc, where the enemy of our heroes wields the power of fate, and is fighting to bring about a specific endpoint that was already predetermined, the reclamation of the world in nine days by Yuha Baha. Kubo explains that with his almighty eyes, Yuha can see the multiple futures that exist as though they were grains of sand, and from his perspective on high, he sees Ichigo and the others try to change their fates, trying to change their future by jumping from one grain of sand onto the other. But as long as he remains on high, he can react accordingly, bringing them to the inevitable end he has chosen, their death. Ichigo's battle against Yuha is one that is in defiance of fate. And like I said at the beginning, in the world of Bleach, fate is not your friend. Fate is your enemy, and Ichigo fights back against fate. He's not being aided by it. So now that we can at least agree on Ichigo's relationship to fate in the story of Bleach, the micro level, if you will, I want to zoom out and look at things from a macro level. This is about the bigger world of Bleach. And so, in order to do this, I'm going to need you to open your mind and expand your understanding. We're going to go really deep into Kubology right now. Okay, so we're set in an undisclosed amount of time in the past. Eons, millennia, take your pick. Point is, we're headed to the origin point of everything. Life before life the world before it was. We don't have every single bit of, I want to say, scientifically sound detail on the specific origin of life, so there's some gaps here. But in a general sense, before the creation of the world we currently know in Bleach, creation was in a state of flux. It was ambiguous, confusing, and unstable. Life and death were intertwined into each other. Progression and regression were not two different sides of the same coin. They were on the same side of the same coin and simultaneously on both sides as well. The cycle of this messed up version of life and death in terms of time was in the hundreds of millions of years. Now, the collection of Ryatu and energy and the raw essences of life were in a constant state of mutation. And I know that sounds crazy, but humans existed within this space back then, born as a result of all these mutations. And eventually, the spiritual mutation at play gave rise to what became the very first Menos Grande. In this Menos would hunt and devour the humans. As these hollows devoured and consumed humans, a new being came into life. This new life form destroyed the Menos and turned it into Sands of Reishi. And when I hear that, I immediately think of the Sands of Wekamundo. If you remember, when Ichigo and the gang went to rescue Urihime, they noticed that the Sands of Wekamundo weren't just sand. There was something more to it, as though it had Ryatsu. This right here could be the origin of said sand. In any case, the being that arose in defense of the humans is what we came to later know as the Soul King, and he defended the humans by killing the Hollows. He did not purify it, no, he killed them. Much like the Quincy that would appear later on in the timeline, the Soul King would erase Hollows from existence. He is a being set to hold powers bordering on omnipotence and omniscience. In other words, the dude was extremely powerful. And during this time, for how long I don't know, but during this range of period, 
other fantastical beings were also born into the world. The mutations that gave forth the Hollows and the Soul King also gave forth to beings with different abilities, but this is where things go off the rails. Five individuals, five people who were not happy with the direction the world was headed in, decided to act. Don't worry, I'll elaborate on all the details in just a little bit. These five people would be the ones to become the founders of the five noble houses of Bleach. The Tsuneyoshiro, the Shihoin, Shiba, Kuchiki, and an unnamed fifth. Now, these five people all wanted to quote, save the world, but they were in it for completely different reasons. The Tsuneyoshiro ancestor was very weary of the power the Soul King possessed. He questioned if the Soul King could be trusted, and he or she believed that there was a possibility that the Soul King would one day turn on them and use his power to dominate the world. That was his reason for wanting to change things. The Kuchiki ancestor was more focused on order and stability. He wanted to calm the chaos and create order. That was his reason. Next was the Shihoin. The Shihoin were focused on creating a larger circulation of souls in order to allow the world to continue to advance. They were focused not on preserving the present, but for the advancement into the future. The Shiba clan wanted to forge a merciful path. They wanted to create a system that allowed for Hollows to be purified and not killed, because he realized that Hollows had hearts as well. But then there was this last ancestor, left deliberately unnamed by Kubo. This ancestor was focused on creating a world that would serve as a lid to cover up something he called the pit. And this pit is what is later known as hell in the world of Bleach. And so, when you think about the current affairs of Bleach, with us in the Hellock right now, there was an ancestor who was focused on covering up the pit of hell, and something tells me we're about to find out who that is relatively soon. The overall point here is though, all five of these people have their own motivations, but their end point is still the same. Something needed to be done about the current state of affairs. The world had to be split and created anew. A world of order had to be made. Life and death had to be separated. But in order to do that, they needed the power of one who transcended everything. One beyond mere human, Shinigami, or Hollow. They needed the Soul King. Their plan was to capture the Soul King character and imprison him inside a crystal of some sort, and then use that crystal enclosure with him in it as the linchpin for the creation of the new world. The Soul King character possessed the power of the Almighty, and that was the power the Five intended to harness in order to complete their mission. However, the Shiba clan wasn't too sure about the method they were planning to utilize. He was on the fence, but the Tsunayashira family head, who was way more motivated, let me say, took control of the operation and did the deed, with the Shiba ancestor going along with it begrudgingly. A new world was created and a new era emerged. The Shinigami would be the balancers and protectors. The humans would live in their world and the Hollows were relegated to the sandy dunes of Wakumundo. The odd factor here though is, the Soul King, with all his powers, he did not resist. And it makes you wonder, why didn't he fight to live? Well, Ichibe theorizes that because this being had the power of the Almighty, he could see into the far future. And maybe it's possible that he saw that a better world lay ahead in the world that is born from his sacrifice. And so for that reason, gave himself up to be a lamb led to the slaughter. That would have been bad enough already, but the five houses did not stop there. The title given to the deviation of fate by the members of the royal household is called the Original Sin. But this title wasn't given specifically because of the sealing of the Soul King. It was given because of what came after. The Tsuneyoshiro ancestors doubted the fact that the Soul King would remain sealed. He was worried that one day, the Soul King might want to be freed and free himself, damning the world. But he also didn't want to kill the Soul King because they knew that they needed him. And so what they decided to do was something truly despicable. Each of them began to tear apart the body of the Soul King. The right arm of stagnation was torn off. The left arm of progress was also torn off. They mutilated his body, taking out his internal organs, cutting off his legs, and even his heart and brain. This reduced his power but kept him alive and he was ultimately unable to free himself while still being able to be the linchpin of the world as we would come to know it. Now, I don't know how the fragments of the Soul King left the possession of the five ancestors, but somehow, some way, over the years, 
the fragments, possessing their own will, managed to find their way to different places. The right arm of stagnation found its way into Mimihagi and later into Jushiro Ukitake. The left arm of progress found its way into Ichibe, with Yuha absorbing it from Ichibe and then into Praninda. Gremi possessed the brain of the Soul King, Jared Valkyrie possessed the heart of the Soul King, Rangiku possessed the nail of the Soul King, and so on and so forth. The details of the original sin were inscribed onto a stone tablet held by the Sunerishiro family, but it was destroyed by Tokinata himself and lost forever. But this act by the noble houses is what led us into the dawn of the Soul Reaper Empire, if you will, and then into the story as we come to know it when Bleach begins. Now, I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to take another step back because I want to contextualize a few things. When Kubo describes the world that existed before, there is a certain quality that shines through. It's a quality of chaos, but not chaos in the sense that you might think. You see, what I believe is that the world of Bleach has a will. There is a divine power of the universe onto itself, and the desire of this universal phenomenon is chaos. The fate that the Bleach universe wants to exist in is perpetual chaos. Understand this. In this primordial world, life and death are mixed. Progression and regression are two sides of the same coin. And what that means in practical terms is that stagnancy of any kind is rejected and will be acted against. The fate of the primordial world of Bleach is a pendulum. It doesn't like it when the pendulum swings one way and stays one way, but it also doesn't like it when the pendulum swings the other way and stays on that side either. What it wants is the constant switching of progression and regression, of life and death, of creation and destruction. That middle point of instability, that middle point of perpetual chaos, that is where it wants to be. That is the sweet spot of the universe. That is the fate it's trying to get to. And the vehicle through which it gets to the fate that it wants is the creation of these phenomenon. Humans are created and they swing the pendulum one way, but we don't want things to stay one way. So the world gives rise to the hollow. The hollow then devour the humans and the pendulum swings the other way. It's not trying to achieve balance and keep the pendulum in the middle. It's trying to maintain a constant swing of left to right, creation to destruction, progression to regression. That is the essence of life and death intertwined. There is no balance because the imbalance is the very point. And so now that it's swung to the other extreme due to the birth of the hollows and the menos, the world responds yet again with the creation of the man who would become the Soul King, all with the intention of keeping chaos flowing. But you see, as I said before, that's where things get interesting, because the Soul King has a will of his own. He's not a blind construct, he's alive. And after he killed the Hollows in defense of the humans, there was a time of peace. Now, if things were left that way, the will of the Bleach world itself would have spawned yet another being to offset the Soul King, so that the pendulum could swing back again once more. But that is where the noble ancestors changed the game. They knew about this idea of progression and regression. They knew that they would never find any semblance of peace with life and death intertwined and mixed together. And they were not interested in living in a world overflowing with perpetual chaos. And so they came up with a plan, which is exactly what I told you just a minute ago. They would use the power of the Soul King to create a new world, one decided upon by they themselves. And by way of creating this world, they could escape the fate of the Bleach universe. They all had specific aspects of things they cared about, and they were all self-serving in very different ways. But the overarching point was still the same. They understood that the natural order of things had them in a never-ending cycle, and they wanted to break that cycle. Examples like these are why I think Bleach has such a unique connection to Shinobu Otaka's Magi series. And by the way, if you've not read Magi, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Get on Magi. It is one of the greatest pieces of manga ever written. Trust me. All right, I would never lie to you. Trust me. You see, in the story of Magi, Shinobu Otaka introduces a very unique concept where the ideals that in other shows would be viewed as supernatural are not actually supernatural per se. In the world of Magi, the idea of the Rook, of depravity, or flow, of destiny, of fate, these are all concepts that in other stories are conceptual ideas beyond the reach of humans within the story. But in Magi, actual humans are behind the creation of their world. 
The world of Magi has a system that was created by individuals with agendas. Destiny isn't some far removed concept. No, Solomon and Ugo created the system that people came to understand and know as destiny, as fate. Humans created that. They were very powerful humans, absolutely, but it wasn't some benign abstract force. No, human beings did that. And a very similar concept exists in Bleach. The world of Bleach as you know it isn't natural. It's unnatural. It's an artificial creation by five individuals with very specific agendas. This isn't a god at work here. These are human-like creatures who made the humane choice to create a world and they set the boundaries of what would be okay and not okay. In order to escape their fate, they separated life and death, they put soul reapers in the soul society as balancers, they put the humans on earth as earthlings, and they relegated the hollows to Wakumundo. And because they couldn't really do anything about the pit of hell, they sort of just put a lid over it and left it in the hands of one noble house. One we'll probably find out in the future. And so once you contextualize this new information and you inject that into the grander scheme of the Bleach series as a whole, what you find is that everything our heroes are doing is an act to prevent the destruction of the fragile world that the Soul Reapers created. Soul Reapers have to cleanse Hollows. If they kill Hollows, the balance and the flow of souls breaks and the system collapses. Not the natural system, no. The system that was built by the nobles. If Hollows are left to hunt humans without control, the balance would collapse and the world would die. Not the real real world, but the created world. If the Quincy are left to kill Hollows without anywhere for the Hollows to pass on, the artificial system in place shatters and everything reverts back to how it was. All of a sudden, with this context, you realize that in the world of Bleach, the powers of the primordial world is trying to gain back control, is trying to gain back the control it lost when the nobles veered away from natural law. They deviated from how things were supposed to be and the world is trying to wring back control. And so you take a step back and you think about it. The action of the nobles were a result of their free will, but that in of itself can be viewed as chaos. What they did in an attempt to stave off chaos was chaos in of itself. And so what does the will of this Bleach universe do? Well, Kubo laid it out. Humans came first. After humans, the world gave rise to the Hollows, who devoured the humans. After the Hollows devoured the humans, the world gave rise to the Soul King, who murdered the Hollows. But after the Soul King killed the Hollows, the Soul Reaper noble houses imprisoned the Soul King and created the Soul Reaper system that caused a glitch in the system. And in response to this new Soul Reaper system, the will of the universe grants a second person the power of the Almighty. Only this time, it's not a Soul Reaper. This time, it's a Quincy. And it's very interesting that when you look at Yuha Baha's motivations besides revenge, you realize that Yuha's goal is to destroy the current Soul Reaper system and return the world to what it once was, with the boundaries between life and death broken down and the two mixed together forever. <laughs> so you see, the will of the world is trying to get back to its endpoint. It's trying to reach the end of its fate. It's trying to get the world back to a state of life and death chaos. And so Yuha shows up, Ichibei Hirosube seals his power, He's then defeated by Yamamoto and sent into slumber, and then returns, killing Yamamoto, killing Ichibe, absorbing the Soul King, and intends to destroy the entire world until Ichigo defeats him. Do you see how Yuha in Thousand Year Blood War is a representation of the will of the Bleach universe to regain control and mark its fate in stone? Kubo echoes this perfectly with one of the most important quotes in Bleach. And it says, If fate is a millstone, then we are the Christ. There is nothing we can do. If I cannot protect them from the wheel, then give me a strong blade and enough strength to shatter fate. Now let's break that down for a second because this is extremely important. What's a millstone? Millstones are stones used in grist mills for crushing and grinding wheat grist, which is essentially grounded grain. The millstone grinds grain into grist. My goodness, try saying that many times in a row. And so if you're the Grist, you're at the mercy of the Millstone. It crushes you and shapes you into what it chooses you to be. Kubo here is saying, the fate of the Bleach universe is one of perpetual chaos, where life and death are mixed and there is no peace. And we, we're the collateral. 
we're at the mercy of the pendulum that swings from side to side, from one extreme to the other, from life to death, from progression to regression. Kubo goes on to say that there is nothing we can do. What he means by this statement is that fate is set in stone, and the will of the universe will not change. He continues on to say, if I cannot protect them from the wheel, then give me a strong blade and enough strength to shatter fate. I will say this once more, guys. I'll say this once more. In the world of Bleach, fate is not your friend. Fate is your enemy. The universe itself has an endpoint it wants to get to. But Ichigo and the others, specifically Ichigo, is acting in defiance of fate. Which is very fitting, because when Ichigo is about to use his Bankai, he speaks directly to Yuha about fate and how he's overcome it over and over to get to this point. Ichigo acts in defiance of fate. But now, let me present you with the why of it all. Here's the bigger overarching point that I'm trying to get to. Bleach right now in the current Soi system is in a state of proverbial peace. The ancestor is deviated from natural law and the will of the world wishes to get things back to how they were before. That is why a being like Yuha shows up, specifically with the Almighty. It's almost as if the universe gifts it to people who have a purpose to play. Sure, you must be a being who's worthy of wielding that power, but there doesn't seem to be a system here because the Soul King just sort of showed up and he already had it. And Yuha Baha, as far as we know, there's nothing special about his birth per se. I mean, if we ever find out, then we'll contextualize that into the grander scheme of things. But currently, there's no established reason why Yuha got the Almighty. It just seems random. The Soul King had it in the past because the world wanted him to destroy the Hollows with it. But humans usurped that power and used it for another purpose. Yuha is then the second person to wield that power. And he did it in an attempt to merge the worlds together again, but he was defeated. And so, my question and my point here is, I find it very fitting that the universe responds again, but this time, we don't deal in humans. We don't deal in hollows. We don't deal in soul yippers. No, the latest attempt by the will of the universe to return the world to chaos is the advent and looming threat of hell. That is why the Hell Arc is so fitting, and that is why Bleach's peak is yet to come, because the Hell Arc is so thematically in line with where all of this has been building to. That is the one place the human ancestors could not control. But unfortunately, they made a massive, massive miscalculation. You see, based on the system that they created, when normal souls die, they become part of the soil and the atmosphere of the soul society, and the total energy becomes recycled. But if you possess Ryatsu to the level of a captain, your energy is too dense to be sent back into the soil of the soul society, and since they can't leave that energy just waiting around, the souls of captains get sent to hell. They take it off the grid and they just stick it in that pit, closing the door. But this is what they did not understand, and this is the sad irony of the situation. The will of the universe wants to get back to chaos. It's always trying to. But the Soul Eepers unknowingly ended up helping the acceleration of their demise by sending Yamamoto Genryusai to hell, by sending Unohana Yachiru to hell, by sending Jushiro Ukitake to hell. They accelerated this process by killing Yuha and sealing Aizen. The byproduct of fighting back against fate, the result of defying the natural order, was the eruption of the one space they had no control over. And as crazy as it sounds, the bowels of hell could no longer be contained and they spilled, overflowing over into our world. And now, our heroes are met with their greatest threat. Now, hell bears its fangs at the world. And you know, as crazy as it sounds, I don't think it stops there. I honestly don't. I think that it is most fitting that the endgame of Bleach is not a battle against some Quincy, or some Soul Reaper, or some Hollow. No, this is bigger than that. The very existence of the Soul Reaper system is an act of defiance, and the will of the world will stop at nothing to destroy it and reclaim control. In the Hell chapter that was released, Kubo crafts a very short story at the beginning that I want to look over because I think it'll help contextualize things even further. In this story, there's somebody who's narrating. We're not quite sure who the narrator is yet, but he basically says that when I was younger, I had two goldfish. I adored the dear things, but one day, the larger one passed away. The remaining goldfish seemed so lonesome 
the sight of it made me feel lonely as well. But after that day, the smaller one, which I thought was stagnating, began to grow larger and flourished more and more. Seeing that brought me great relief. Ah, thank goodness. It was good that the larger one died. This isn't breaking news, I'm sure a lot of you already know this. But I think these two fish is just representing the created system of the noble houses and hell. At the start, hell was just a pit. We just closed it off and we forgot about it. We're not going to care about you. It's in the hand of the nobles. Not a lot of people are even going to know that you exist per se. It's just gone. We don't want you. We can't control you, so just go over there. We're going to use you as a jail cell to put the captains Ryatsu who we can't control because we don't want it to interfere with our current livelihoods. We're just going to use it as a dumping off point for the Ryatsu of the captains who can't be reincarnated back into the soil of the soul society. But unbeknownst to you, by choosing to send those captains here, you probably thought that would never come to this. You thought and you assumed the Soypers are going to live for thousands and thousands of years. What could possibly happen to cause a large number of souls to just disappear at once? And not just any souls, specifically powerful souls. What could possibly happen? But then all of a sudden, Aizen Sosuke shows up and you seal him, taking him out of the equation. All of a sudden, Yuhabaha shows up and he kills a lot of people, including Yamamoto. As a result of the war, when Ohana Yachiru dies, and then after Yuha absorbs the Soul King, he dies. Now, one world is dying and the other benefits as a result. I believe this is a byproduct of the will of the Bleeds universe trying yet again to regain control. Because it doesn't want to accept this created system by the Noble Houses. It's trying to regain control and send the world back into perpetual chaos. And the vehicle through which it's going to accomplish it this time is hell. But even though that's already plenty bad, I have a nasty feeling that the difference between the threat of hell and everywhere else is that the will of the universe will say, enough with giving this task to this guy or that guy to do. Enough with delegating this job to that person or the other person to do. No, enough of that, no more. I'll do it myself. I think that it would be incredibly fitting if the will, the desire, the fate of the universe itself is made manifest. I think it would be extremely fitting for a final try to return the world to what it once was. An embodiment of the progression and regression. An embodiment of creation and destruction. Not a devilish figure like Aizen or a godly figure like Yuha. No, we already did the devil narrative that was Aizen. We already did the angelic narrative that was Yuha. This time we're going to something more abstract, more complicated. And Kubo is no stranger to having things be embodiment of other things. Baragon is the embodiment of senescence, stark to loneliness, Ukiwa to nihilism, and so on. It would fit thematically into the world of Bleach, fully. And it would give so much more meaning to Kubo's poem about fate. Because in this moment, your enemy isn't wielding fate against you. Your enemy is fate made manifest. And this enemy is calling on the powers of the old world calling on the powers of the old Soripa captains from generations past, drawing on all that history, drawing on all the weight of the past and bringing that into the present for a clash to combine life and death together once again and return the world into how it used to be before the nobles deviated from the natural law. And finally, this clash with fate in of itself becomes so fitting because a clash between the past and the present for a battle to decide the fate of the entire universe of Bleach is more Bleach than many other things, I'll tell you that. And with Ichigo spearheading the attack, because as Kubo established in the poem, Ichigo wants a blade and enough strength to shatter fate. But now you're not fighting a dude who's wielding fate. No, this time you're going up against fate made manifest. And as for Ichigo's son Kazui, well... <laughs> Who knows what that boy's thinking? Who knows? All I'll say is this. All I'll say is this. It wouldn't surprise me if he has a huge part to play in this because, you know, we already know that the will of the universe it likes, it likes to choose people every now and then. You know, it chose the Soul King. It chose Yuha. Not going to be surprised if Kazui has a part to play in all of this. But like I said before, who knows what that little boy is thinking? Who knows? Anyway, thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you learned something. Like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next Rebirth video.
This is your boy, signing out. Peace.